think about it in clothing, you add water, the cotton isn't going to dissolve. Whereas if you're actually working with wood pulp, and you know regular paper products that are just pressed it might work fine at first but the more water you add the more scrubbing the more working with the brush the more that might break down because um lower quality paper is pressed and held in by sizing and that sometimes it's over hello everyone and welcome to another episode of healing art after hours i'm shauna robson with creating space coastal and in this video i'm going to be introducing watercolor materials i know it can be overwhelming with all the various choices of brushes and paper and paints that are out there and it can be overwhelming when you're just starting so in this episode we will be just talking about what is the difference between student quality, artist quality, why get this or that, or what to expect from whatever supplies that you use. So if you're interested in learning more, stay tuned. Let's get started. Size or there's not enough sizing, but it just, the paper's not going to be as durable and hold up to a lot of working. So you'll just find that if you do like to use a lot of water and you like to do a lot of working with it, maybe scrubbing or different tech, different effects, uh, if you're using a lower quality paper, you're just going to find that that paper might start uh, basically dissolving and breaking apart. So you have to be a little bit more gentle with uh, with that lower quality paper, and you can you can really put a lot of energy into a cotton paper, and it and it holds up pretty well. Um, texture, as I mentioned before, there's various textures, and I'm going to show you a picture of an example of that. But hot press, if you think about being ironed, so that's the smoothest. Uh, level of the watercolor and then cold press is kind of middle of the roll the road it's it's pressed but it's not like ironed down so it's a little bit medium texture and that's usually what I would recommend using to for starting out that's that's just a you know kind of middle of the road now hot press is really great if you want to doing fine details if you really want every single stroke let's say you're doing animal hair or things like that where you want um, all those little details to show you're going to probably want to maybe use a hot press. The, the color is going to be, or the watercolor is not going to move as much as like a cold press or a rough. Um, so you have a little bit more control of the water. Cold press is in the middle of the road. And then rough, of course, has significant tooth. Again, I'll explain that a little bit more detailed shortly. But um, that is going to have less control, a little more roughness, maybe some dry brushing effects, which means that you're going to see some of that white through and a lot of more texture in your painting than with a cold press or hot press. So those are the three common ones that you'll find. And the paper can come in several different forms. They can be pads, like you tear off a pad of paper, has one side that's glued down. The blocks are glued down on all four sides, and that allows you to not have to tape those. Those are a little bit more expensive because, you know, they, they have the added um, added work done ahead of time. And then sheets, they can you can get them in singular sheets too, depending on just where you're going for your paper. Now here's an example of the hot press, cold press, and rough, and you can see the different textures in that. And this is what I mean by tooth. So if you think of these as like the, the tooth and then the valley, so the rougher it is, the more valleys you have the higher the, the peaks and the lower the valleys. So when you're painting over that, you just might get more of the white paper showing through. If you're trying to create some texture, you might want that. Um, with Whereas hot press, which is very smooth, it's still gonna probably have just a slight texture, um, but it's gonna just definitely be a lot more, more smooth. It's not gonna have the likelihood of that white showing through as much. You're gonna really control the the pigment and where it goes. And then the cold press, like I said, is middle of the road. And that's what I would recommend if you're just learning. Gives you some flexibility because the more you add, the more you can fill in those white spaces and you can do some details, just not as much as a hot press. Sometimes they'll sell packs of multiple different types of paper. So you can try out a bunch of different ones. All right, now let's talk a little bit about paint. Um, the first of all, people are like, well, which is the best brand? And it just really depends. A lot of artists will swear by whatever brand they're using and i'll and i'll be honest i mean i haven't tried every brand it gets really expensive to try to try every brand so the reality is that i um i can't tell you what every brand is like i've tried i've tried several brands 
but um, a one common one that you'll find a lot of places, even in some of the more crafty stores, is the Windsor Newton. And they do have a student grade, which is called Cotman, and a professional grade, Windsor Newton. So, um, and this is a popular one because it's, it's pretty good quality either for their student grade or their professional artist grade. And um, it's just, like I said, easy to find. Now, sometimes you can buy these in sets where they come with the palette of colors and you don't have to think about what colors to use, but we're gonna talk a little bit about choices in that shortly. Now, I use the M Gram and I like the M Gram because they use a honey base. So it's really kind of a gummy texture. And even when I put it on my palette, it never dries to like a hard, um, kind of rock, you know, like sometimes I've used some paints that once they dry, it's really hard to reactivate the pigment. Now, watercolors do stay water soluble, no matter what, they never dry permanently. Now, it may be that they're absorbed into the paper and you can try to, to you know, you can add water and there might be staining involved, but watercolors, the the substrate or I mean the binder of it is water soluble and so it breaks down with water so you can always loosen watercolors with water so even if the tube dries up you could cut open a tube and still activate that watercolor but sometimes the watercolor depending on the brand whatever the binder is just isn't as soft and pliable it takes a lot more water to get it to to activate or release the pigment. And when that happens, one of the challenges with that is that you have to, to add a lot more water, which makes you water down the pigment more than maybe you want to. So that's the challenge of having more, like a lower quality paint might have binders that are just not as, like I said, pliable. Like honey is a great binder because it's really, really, it stays really juicy and allows you to get a lot of that pigment to, to release fairly easily. Um, but again, all, you know, when you're watching your favorite artists, keep an eye on what they like. Now, when Kyle was talking about that book, that artist probably has a favorite, favorite, um, type of paint that they like. And so they use the palette that's available for that particular paint. And they can really only share their experience with that paint because that's what you're, they're using. So they're going to probably, you know, try to give you as close to what they're using as possible. And some of these color names, and again, I'll be talking about this in a little more detail later, they're not equal across the board. So maybe Windsor Newton uses their name a lot in their colors, but other colors, so they might have Windsor Newton yellow. Well, what is that if I'm using the M Gram, for example? So hopefully some of the resources I'm going to give you tonight will help you figure that out, especially when you're trying to compare apples to oranges. It's not always that easy, but I could hopefully help you make it easier. Now they come in different forms. You can get it in tube, which is my, my preferred type. And that comes in kind of like a toothpaste, basically. It comes out like a toothpaste. And I usually recommend that if you are using the tube, especially if you're new, let it dry overnight before you start actually using it on a project, just because you're likely to use too much of the pigment. You'd really, a little look goes a long way. Watercolors are packed with pigment. They're very small bottles, but unlike the acrylics, um, which you can, you know, you can get bigger tubes and things of the acrylics, but um, watercolors are more concentrated in that pigment because you have to add water to it to activate it. With acrylic, you can just take it out of the tube and put it right on the canvas and use it directly. You can also dilute it with water, but with watercolors, you need to use some water. You're not, you're not taking the full pigment and putting it on the paper. That's very wasteful. So don't do that. If you are putting it right out of the tube, just make sure you just, just grab a little bit of that pigment out of that, that little tube, um, the amount that you, the paste that you put on your palette, just take a little bit at a time until you get your saturation that you want. And I'll be going over all of this, of course, as we progress through the month, how to do all of that. But I just want you to be aware in case you go grab all that. I just don't want you to run out and then get the tubes and then waste too much of that thing because it can be expensive, especially if you get the higher quality peat. Um, uh, so then they can also come in a pan and that comes already hard. And I'll show you an example of that too. But here's, here's my two paints already put in a palette. 
So the pans are basically just little cubes that you can buy and they're already hardened so you don't have to harden them yourselves. But I prefer the tubes because I think it's a little more inexpensive over time because I can refill my these little wells with my own paint. And I can choose, you know, whatever paint I want. I don't have to choose only those paints that have an option of the of the pans. And they sell them in different size pans. There's half pans and full pans, which I'll show you an example of, a, of that um, shortly. Uh, pans are easy to use. The nice thing is they're already hardened, so you're not going to spill them and things like that. Now, with mine being honey-based, if I pack up this palette and I turn it sideways and I take it with me on the go, over time, it's going to, the my pigment's going to move. Some of those are going to move a little bit more than I want. And so that's the challenge with having it too soft of, a, of the binder. But I prefer to err on that side than having too hard where they turn into little like pills, they, you know, that you can't get any pigment out of. Um, but pans are nice for travel. I do have a little travel kit that is a student grade that I use for like if I go hiking or things like that and I just want to do a small project. The other thing that's nice about the tubes is if you're doing a large project, it allows you to put as much pigment as you need. If you're doing a, a really giant canvas, um, then you're going to want to be able to put more pigment down than you can in a small little well like this. So it just gives you the flexibility uh, over the pan, for example. And you can use larger wet, you can use different size wells if you're using larger sized brushes. So if I'm doing a larger project, this probably wouldn't really work because I can't really get my larger brush in there very well. Um, you know what I'm saying? So you can always have the flexibility with the, with the tubes. There are other variations too. There's sticks, of course, there's watercolor pencils, there's powders that you can mix with your own binder if you want. And I don't really have, I mean, I have watercolor pencils, but I don't have experience with the other, the other two. And there probably are some other formats out there that I haven't experienced. So play around with, you know, what, what you like to do. All right, here's an example. I was mentioning that Windsor and Newton does have two options. And here's an example of them comparing them side by side. This is the Cotman. This is more the student quality. Now with student quality, you can certainly use it. The differences between these two is this is going to probably have maybe the binder is going to be um, more prominent than the pigment, maybe less pigment or the pigment's not going to be as high quality mineral as you would find with a professional level. So the result of that is you're going to have to probably lay down more layers of the paint, which uses more of the paint subsequently uh, than if you were using the professional level paint. So that's just, you know, one of those options. There's, there's different light fastness, there's different granularity, just the quality of the, the minerals, how, how fine they grind them down in order to get more mineral per drop of the paint. So there are reasons that you would want to consider a professional over a student grade, but if you're just beginning, I am no way in saying to start with something that's the higher end because you got to find out if you love watercolors in the first place. Now, even those ones that you can get that are just, um, you know, like the really, now when I'm talking student grade, that can be a high range from kindergarten to college. So really in everything in between, there's a high range of quality in the student grade or the non-professional grade. So even if you just get the palette, you have no idea any of the components of it, you know, what you're gonna find is, is possibly some chalkiness, maybe some granulation in that. I'm gonna go in some details of, of the comparison in a little bit, uh, but they are different. So there is a reason why you pay more for higher quality. This is even more than what you're gonna pay for something that you, like I said, you can find at Michael's or some other hobby store. Donna? Yeah. Mo, Mo is asking, what does light fastness mean? Oh, well, light, and I'm going to actually go over that. Good question. It, it means that it resists fading. So when you're getting something that's a high, the higher quality, oftentimes, oftentimes 
it'll fade over time. So maybe it'll be this vibrant magenta. And then, you know, depending on the quality, it might fade to a pale pink. So the way the light fastness just means it's going to hold its, it's going to hold its color over time being exposed to like ultraviolet light. And the higher quality it is, the more, and the, the longer it's going to last. Now that's another reason why it's a good idea to put a protector over the top of watercolors because that's going to help reduce the UV effects as well. So thank you for that question. Okay, so there are many other characteristics like light fastness, um, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about those and then how to figure out what your paints have. Now, if you buy, like I said, a really inexpensive palette, that's fine. I'm not saying not to use that and not to do that. You can learn a lot by practicing with those. It's just you're going to get a different a different outcome. That's all. That's the only difference. You're going to get just a different expectation out of it. But if it's a if it's a higher quality, even if it's a higher quality student grade, you're gonna it's going to give you some information about the characteristics of the paint. It's going to tell you what the pigments are made up of, for example, because just like when you go to Home Depot or some hardware store and you have them mix your paint to for your wall. You'll notice that they have this little um, recipe on the can that's how they mix that paint. And what it is, is just a, a mix of ingredients of pigments. So in order to get a certain color, there's a certain mix of certain pigments. And that's, the, that's true with this as well. Now, sometimes, are, sometimes they're a single pigment, and that tends to be higher quality, easier to mix because you're not, you're not mixing something that that has a variety of colors already in it. And the more that you, the more colors that are in it, the muddier it can get. And sometimes to make things a little bit more cost effective, they'll mix more pigments to try to, to try to approximate a color to create a color for like, you know, in, with using cheaper products to get the same color. So that's what happens with like the lower price um, paint is you're gonna have maybe not as pure of a pigment you might get uh, the cheaper components to make up and try to, like I said, approximate it. But when you try mixing that with another color, because it's not as pure, it might not, the outcome might not be what you expect. So just being aware of that and knowing what your paints do is the key to this. Now, um, like I said, single pigment typically is, is the preferred if possible. But with the, the advent of so many different color options nowadays in all of these different paint um, made by all these different manufacturers, they do their own mixing for you so you don't have to mix all your paints. If you are doing the basic, basic, basic um, palette, really all you would need is yellow, blue, and red because those are the primary colors. And you can mix all of those to get a range of colors. Um, but there are different, you know, there are warmer reds and cooler reds. So which red do you use? So you would want to use a real neutral red. But if you wanted to be the minimalist, you could really get uh, just a middle of the road red, middle of the road yellow, and a mid middle of the road blue. And you could mix a whole host of colors, which we'll talk about during color when we do the color, color theory class this month. So um, if you see hue, in the name of a paint, that usually means that it's a more modern uh, mix because back in the day when they started making watercolors, they crushed up these minerals and a lot of them are made, the names are made with the, the name of the mineral, like cobalt blue. That was cobalt is the mineral that was used. And if it says cobalt blue hue, that means that instead of using cobalt, they're just using something else, but it's still trying to approximate that color. And that doesn't mean that that's lower quality. It can, it can mean that they're using cheaper components to make it, but it could also mean that cobalt is toxic, or it could be that cobalt's difficult to find, um, or maybe they found something that's a better, that works better. So it, a hue just means that it's not necessarily their, the original, historical mineral that was used, but it's it's approximating that color for various reasons. You might see hue more often in a, in a student grade just because they might be using lower cost uh, minerals to keep the pri prices down. 
then you will see in professional, but you'll also see it in professional because like I said, it's not always just because they're trying to find cheaper. It's, it's sometimes it's, it's just better for the environment or better for your health. And that's important. Um, the, the quality, of course, for higher quality, the ratio of pigment to binders is a characteristic that you'll find more pigment to binder in a higher quality paint. So that just makes sense. They just add more of the mineral and less of the filler or extenders or binders. And those are just things that make, you know, bring the cost down and of course, hold it together. It's kind of like the glue that holds the, the paint together. Um, and extenders are usually think additives that help keep it, um, I believe that it helps keep it um, moist longer extenders, but don't hold me, I'm not positive about that. Granulation happens. Now some very high quality paints do have granulation and that's fun to use. I think ultramarine might be one of those that are, that tend to have granulation. Um, and that has to do with the size of the mineral, the grounding of the minerals. And some minerals just maybe have a bigger molecule size or whatever. But uh, also you'll find some granulation in lower quality paints just because they don't do as fine a process of, gr of grinding that mineral or that pigment um, down. So just be aware that that's a feature to, to look for. And you'll find if you look at the tubes, oftentimes the tubes will have some of this information, maybe not all, but, um, but it, it will have usually at least the makeup of the pigments but sometimes it'll have a code for all of these things. Transparency, um, this is kind of the, so opacity is when you can't see through something. So acrylics tend to be really opaque. If you're using acrylic full, you know, fully saturated, you basically could paint right over something and you're not gonna see whatever was below it. And of course there's different opacities for, for colors in acrylics too, but they tend to be more opaque if you're using the gouache, gouache is watercolor that is opaque. It's more chalky. It's not gonna, you're not gonna see through it um, to the colors below. So different paints, different pigments have different levels of transparency, even if not just compared to gouache and watercolor, regular water, watercolors, but just within different colors. So you can see the transparency and if you, um, painted it over like a black Sharpie line. And the more you can see the line, the more transparent it is. Sometimes they're semi, sometimes they're op levels of opaque. So if you painted over a black Sharpie and you couldn't see the black Sharpie underneath, it's completely opaque. Staining is when you lay down the pigment and then you try to lift it. So lifting is one of the techniques that we'll talk about in a, in a later chapter. But um, if you try to, let's say you took you laid some pigment down and then you took a, a paper towel and you tried to, to lift before it dried, you tried to lift it, you tried to um, press it down to, to clean off that paint. It may be too late because it may be a staining pigment. Now, a lot of times like some of the, like alizarin crimson, I think is pretty staining, it's a red. So it's staining the paper um, just from the pigment. It's not just lifting those minerals off, it's just, it's gonna stay pink. So some paints stain more than other paints or other colors actually. So, and of course I would say maybe even within different paints groups, but some colors are just more staining. So these are just some characteristics that you'll be able to learn about as you play around with your paints. You'll get to know, know the characteristics of them and know what you can and cannot do. Let's say you're trying to lift off um, clouds, for example, and so you lay down some blue and you want to you want to touch it with some, with a rag and try to lift off the pigment to make some cloud shapes. If you know that that blue is staining, you're going to use a different blue if you're really wanting to get back that that white underneath. So those are just some things you want to know about the paint just to know of what you're able to do. And that's a little more advanced right now. You don't have to worry about all that, but I just want you to be aware that those different characteristics exist. So as you start playing with your paints, you can kind of start paying attention to how they behave and how they work in different settings. Now, if you don't have the information on the labels themselves, you can usually go to the website of whatever the company, so this is M. Graham, you can go to the website and they're going to give you a breakdown of their colors. 
And in this case, they have these codes and they explain that in this legend here of what these different codes mean. And like I said, this is maybe more advanced, but I do think one thing I really want to have stressed to you tonight is to learn about the color, the pigments. Um, but anyway, so you'll be able to find out that information from, from the websites typically. So here's what I'm talking about with why it's important to understand the pigments and the pigment formula. So there's a their pigment color index, and it usually starts with a P and a, and a letter or, two, or more than one letter. And that just means pigment yellow. So that means that the, the, the recipe for this paint color is pigment yellow and then there's a number and the number is like a pigment yellow one pigment yellow two pigment yellow 154 so it just means that that's the color index and when you go to this main database you can find out what that color is and what it's made of and what what the chemical compounds are and all the details about it now many paints are a mix of a variety of these pigments and you'll see multiple color codes on here. So for example, this one contains four pigments, PG, which is pigment green, 36, pigment yellow, three, pigment orange, 48, pigment yellow, 150. The important thing that you need to know about this is this one has four pigments, but the name is hooker's green. The name of this <laughs> one is also hooker's green, but only two pigments and it's PG7 and PY110. So even though it's the same marketing name or generic name that you might see on the shelf, it's not the same recipe. Just like if you made chocolate chip cookies, your recipe may differ, right? From one chocolate chip to another. Well, that's the same here. So if you ran out of Hooker's Green in your brand, and you're like, well, I'm just gonna buy a hooker's green in this brand and that'll be fine. You're not gonna get the same green because it's a different recipe. So just be aware, especially if you're not having that single pigment uh, color that you're gonna have a mix and you wanna make sure that you're matching your formula, your chemical formula. So understanding those pigment colors is helpful for that. This is an example, there's a link here to this database and you could go in and look up any of those formulas, the index, and find out exactly what that is. It's gonna give you information about the chemical, the safety of it, light fastness, all these different things, opacity. So you can do your own research. This is, you know, if you wanna really get into it. But basically how to read this chart is the color index is here. That's that pigment yellow one, for example. The historical name or the original chemical name that it was called is Hansa or Hansa yellow, G. And then here's a list of, oops, wrong page. Here's a list of a bunch of common names you might find on the market today. So for example, if I'm looking at, um, let's see, usually there's a Windsor Newton. I'm not seeing it here, but, but somewhere, maybe it's down further. But usually um, these little codes here off to the side are the, the companies that use that particular name. But you might find this one pigment called these different names, depending on which manufacturer you're buying it from. So it can be a little bit tricky when you're trying to match up, when you're looking at a book and someone says, oh, use cadmium yellow, but you have Windsor yellow, it might be the same yellow. So you, if in order to know that, you look at this index and that'll help you find out if you're actually matching, you can compare those apples to oranges and make them apples to apples, if that makes sense. I hope I'm not making it too complex for you. I'm really trying to simplify it, but it is a little bit confusing because all the, everybody wants to use their fun marketing names. So this one, this one pigment can be called cadmium yellow, lemon yellow, azo yellow, orange. So just depending on the manufacturer. So be, being aware of that will help you when you're trying to navigate the colors. Now here's an example. I did a chart. This is a basic 
a simple palette that, that you might consider if you're new. Like I said, if you're really a minimalist, you can just do the red, yellow, blue. But if you want to have a little more flexibility and don't and don't spend all your time trying to mix and get that perfect green, you might just want to cheat a little bit and let them do some of the mixing. So this is a palette of a warm and cool from each color group. I kind of did the rainbow. Um, so a red, a, um, a cool and a warm red. And here I put the color index This is pigment red 108. And the historic name is cadmium red, but if you're using a marketing name for Windsor Newton, it's also cadmium red in that case. Cool is perylene maroon or alizarin crimson are historic names, but for Windsor Newton, it's permanent alizarin crimson. So, and I just go through the same thing. So you could look through the chart. Now, the one additional thing I wanted to show you was that in this case, I added this indigo because it's Roy G. Biv, just like the rainbow. I added a little bit of um, red, red, and of course, red and yellow makes an orange. So that's a secondary color. So I didn't put orange in there, but it's pretty easy to mix oranges. Greens can be a little trickier. So I did add the green. That's also a secondary color, meaning that you have to mix two primary colors, a yellow and a blue. Again, color theory, and I'll talk more about that later to make greens, but I just thought, you know, greens are really handy to have. So I did include that in there. And then violet is also a, a kind of, a can be a tricky color. So I included that secondary color as well, a warm and a cool version of each of those. Indigo, you'll notice that the color index is a recipe. It's not a single pigment. So indigo, the Windsor Newton indigo might be this recipe, but some other paint, some other brand, might be a completely different recipe. And matter of fact, I have the Schmanke or Schmanka. I probably don't know if I'm saying that right. I should have checked that out. And their recipe is PB15-1 and PB66. So there's a prime example of two paints called indigo, but a completely di different recipe. So be aware of that. And you can, like I said, if you get the notes, you can check out the details of all of these, um, these screens, but I just wanted to give you kind of a highlight. So to summarize it, if you're going towards the student quality, there are a lot of options and there's a wide range of quality from very, very affordable and they might work perfectly fine to um, a more like higher end student quality, like for maybe college student quality. And then of course the artist quality. So the student quality, the pros, they're more affordable. There's a high range of um, quality in there so you can find the right quality for you. It does have a lower ratio of the pigment to binders typically. Now I, I, I'm gonna assume that, that most of these are going to be lower ratio than all of the artist quality because that's one of the features, but I can't even say that for sure because I don't know every single artist quality. But if they're saying it's artist quality, I'm expecting it to be a higher pigment ratio and more vibrant color. Um, the color may not be as vibrant just because of whatever the binders or additives that are in there. So you may have to just add more layers, which is perfectly fine, but just be aware you use a little bit more. Um, if you're getting those pans that kind of look like eyeshadow, you know, looks like a palette of eyeshadows, just be aware that sometimes that binder doesn't want to release the pigment. So you're forced to, to scrub, which isn't good for your brush or add more water, which can dilute the color even more. So, um, so there are challenges involved in that. Um, it can be a little bit more chalky and more opaque just because the binder might be chalk. And so it, you might not get that nice transparent look that's great when you want to do tinting and layering and things like that. Um, it also may have some more granulation if they just haven't ground down those minerals very finely. Artist quality, more smooth and vibrant color, higher pigment. Um, so it go, a little goes a long way. One tube is going to last longer because like I said, you don't have to do as many layers of it and uh, you're just going to get more pigment packed into the same size tube. The color activates more easily and this is not, um, it, it, it likely is going to, like I said, because of the, the whatever the binder is and how it's, it's um, created, 
but this can vary even within the artist qualities. I've had some artist qualities that dry, like I said, like a little, like almost like a pill, like they're really hard and they are really hard to activate. So um, this can range. And then um, the color typically is more light fast, less likely to fade over time. So what you get is what you get. Uh, and especially if you do any kind of coating or UV protection over the top of either of those, that's going to help. But just in general, you're going, they're going to be a lot more light fast. And um, yeah, you can use less paint to get the desired effect. I think I already mentioned that. All right, brushes. Um, I can't use this one. Okay. So anatomy of a brush, a lot of things I'm not going to go over, but typically you're going to see information about the brush, the size, the brand, etc. cetera. Um, be aware that sizes are not consistent, and I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute. But uh, here is the, the hairs or the bristles, the belly, and then the tip. Now this is a round brush, but you'll notice that it comes to a really nice fine tip. And that's what you want to see. Typically when you go shopping for brushes, they use some starch and they, they bring the bristles to a nice point so that you can see the quality of it. Because really, when they're not wet, sometimes you can't see that point. So what they do is when they, when they manufacture them and they, they get them ready for the store, they put a little starch in there and they bring them to a point so you can see the quality of the point. So you do want to have that option because this gives you flexibility with this shape of brush. You can use the belly, which gives you a broad stroke, and you can use the tip to do very fine details. And round is one of the most popular brushes. If, if people don't use any other shape, typically they go with brown, because uh, round, not brown, I don't know, <laughs> round, uh, because it's just highly flexible in what it can do. And, um, and we'll give you examples of that. I like to also have a flat brush. I use that for my washes. I can also use that for architecture. When we did the barn, for example, I showed you some of the ways that I use that. You can get a, you can kind of do some side swipes and get a straight line. So I like having at least a flat uh, and round. The other shapes have their functions and features. But if you're just trying to, again, go for minimalists and basics, if you're just learning, I would say start out with round and flat. Now, this is the ferrule uh, and the crimp. And, I, and I'm bringing this up because I'm going to talk a little bit about, shortly I'm going to be talking about the taking care of your brush. And so this is where the bristles are glued in, in this area here. There's, there's glue under there that holds the bristles in. And when that glue starts to dissolve, the bristles can fall out. So if you're not taking care of your brush, um, that can happen. And I'll, talk, I'll give you some tips on how to do that shortly. All right, so there's different materials of the bristles. You can get natural, which tends to hold more of the pigment than synthetic. And you can typically you can get a finer point on this, the naturals. Nowadays, they have some really high quality synthetics. So I don't know for sure that that's even true, depending on the quality of synthetic that you can get. But some of the natural options that are out there include sable, which is um, the Kalinsky sable is, is, a, is a favorite to a lot of artists and it has a nice spring to the bristles, which means it holds its shape and it also can hold a lot of pigment. So it, it's got, you know, it's got good qualities there. Squirrel can hold a lot of pigment, but it doesn't have as much snap. So when you, when you make a brush stroke, it might stay kind of stay bent, for example, and you may not control it as easy, like if you're trying to draw shapes like you would with a script brush, or I mean, um, like if you're trying to draw out a shape and you want to have control of that tip, it's just not going to be as easy with that soft bristle like a squirrel. Um, ox, hog, boar, you might see all of those. Those are a little bit coarser um, and give maybe more texture but less control. And then camel is used, but um, I, my understanding is it's the poorest quality and, and usually it doesn't even um, have camel. It's like horse or goat, so I don't know. Um, synthetic comes in nylon, polyester, um, possibly other materials that I'm not sure about, but there are some really great options out there for that. It is more animal friendly, so if that's important to you, great. Um, 
but it's also less environmentally friendly. So there's just, you know, two sides of that coin. You decide, I'm not gonna recommend anything specific. They do tend to have springier bristles uh, than, than, a, than the natural. Then they have mixed options out there. And sometimes you don't, you won't know, it might be labeled as synthetic, but it might actually still have some natural fibers in it. So just if you're, if you do care and you don't, you want to make sure to be animal friendly that you just do your research behind it. Um, and those can give you a nice point. They hold a lot of, that holds a lot of pigment. And then also you have the springiness that you get with that synthetic. So this is a nice option if you're, you know, kind of on the fence. Now I was talking about size earlier, and this is a size chart. And sometimes you'll see the fraction numbers on your brush. Sometimes you'll see just these um, whole digits. The problem with these are, is that they are specific to the manufacturer. In this case, it's the size of the ferrule opening where the bristles come out. It's whatever this width is here. Now, this is the these are measurements in metric and imperial. And then this is the number that might be on the brush. And the problem with that is that there's no rhyme or reason. It's just basically they start at their smallest and then they go larger, as far as I can tell. Like this is not, there's no 16 in this number over here. So a six in this brand might be larger or smaller than a six in another brand. So when you're trying to follow along with another artist, it's good if you know what brand they're using. And you could even ask them if they would give you a measurement of this, because that's gonna tell you more than this, this generic marketing number will. If it's late, sometimes they're labeled this where, way where they'll have the actual measurement on the brush. And I like that because that gives you specific, you know, apples to apples comparison if you're trying to find, you know, trying to match up with somebody else. So just be aware of that. If you, if you just go by these whole numbers on the brush, you, you may not end up with the same thing. And the size of the brush that you want to use is really going to depend on the size of projects you're doing. If you're working with really small, like a three by four inch canvas, like I've done with my mini masterpiece, you may only need some of these smaller brushes. But if you're working with a 12 by 16, you may want some of these brushes. And they even go up bigger than this. This is just an example. There's two inch flat brushes and on up. So, um, so anyway, just be aware and decide on the sizes based on what size you're working with. And I would say if you're just starting out, pick something kind of middle of the road. Um, I would say you might want one or two or three different sizes just to, to help you with fine details and then bigger broad stroke details. And then maybe like, a, you know, one or two of the flat brushes. Um, especially for doing washes, I think those are those are helpful, and that tends to be a little bit on the larger side. You want to be able to get across the whole page in one stroke without running out of paint. So you want to have a big enough brush. If I try to get across 12 inches of paper with this little tiny brush, it's not going to give me, it's not going to go very far because that can't hold the amount of paint. Obviously, the bigger the brush, the more paint it can hold, and also the longer the bristles. So you might see a one inch flat and th that has a one inch length bristles, but you also might see a one inch by two inches, and that two inches is going to hold a lot more paint than the one inch because it just has more bristles to absorb that, that paint and pigment and water. All right, here are some tips to take care of your brushes, especially if you're investing in good quality brushes. Don't leave the brushes in water. I know when we go to those, uh, those acrylic paint nights, they just throw those brushes in the water and leave them there the whole night. And there's, it's, a, it's a fine line between, you know, getting, cleaning them fast enough, but when you leave them in the water, it loosens that glue that's holding those bristles in. So you're going to have bristles starting to fall apart. And those brushes that they use for those nights are pretty cheap and they just don't care. I mean, that's the bottom line. And if you leave the, if you leave acrylic paint on brushes, that hardens and is, and, and then you can't get it off. So that also ruins the bristles. So they just balance it out and say, you know what, we're going to use cheap brushes and just throw it in the water and leave it there. <laughs> but if you're buying quality brushes, whether it's for acrylics or watercolor, please don't leave it in the water. It's not good for it. It also isn't good for the bristles 
because the, the bristles are basically laying flat at the bottom. So now you're bending your bristles. And sometimes the longer they sit in a certain way, the more they hold that shape and it's harder to get them to straighten out. You have to maybe use some hot water or something to reshape those bristles, uh, especially with acrylics because, you know, they're, they're plastic and they're, they're formable, right? They're, they're moldable. So uh, don't store them in anything bristle down, even in when they're dry, don't store them bristle down because again, you can ruin the bristles and the tip. Um, and let's see, I already, oh, and then water can also damage the wood handle because of course it's got some kind of protective coating on it, but water is just gonna break it down over time. Always wash after painting, whether it's watercolor or not, watercolor does wash off even after it's dried, which is the great thing about it, but it can still, you know, holding that pigment in can still damage it. And also what can happen is you've forgotten that you used it and you didn't wash it. And then you go to use it on a color that doesn't work with the color that's on there. And you can also, you know, ruin your artwork. You know, you dip it in the water and think it's clean and then you put it in your paint and it's got black in it or something like that. So just, you know, it's always a good practice to rinse them off real well. And when you're drying, don't don't dry them up with the bristles up because all of that water that's now on the bristles is gonna run down into that ferrule. And again, do the same thing. It's gonna loosen that glue over time. So it's just a better practice to lay them flat. So after you wash them, you can blot them on a cloth and I always roll them and then I'll even pull the bristles to a tip. And I like to store, you know, I'll just dry them either like I try not to have the bristles touching anything, but maybe like over the top of a cup or something so that the bristles are not, you know, necessarily touching the ground or just laying up against the cloth or something like that where the bristles are sort of in the air, but not up so that the water's running down. Um, and I think I covered all of that. Okay. Shauna, can I, can I ask something? Sorry. Yeah. About, yeah, about that right there. So, so you want to dry them upside down and then you can just leave them upside down because I, I see it says don't store brushes tip up but it says don't brush so you just you could just leave them hanging upside down all the time so if you have a device that will like like clip the brush in because there there are brush holders yeah. that do that where they'll clip the top and then you have the bristle down and it's free flowing and not touching the ground that would be ideal you could leave them stored that way there are many other supplies that I use. And of course, if you download my supply list, you're going to see those. Of course, you need water because you always have to add water. Never use the pigment straight. So that's important to remember. And I like two containers for water because one I use when my brushes, if I'm trying to, let's say, go from red to green, I don't want any red on my, on my brush. So what I'll do is when it's when it's got the red in it, I'll put it in the one jar and that'll get the pigment off. And then I take it to the clean jar and that just gives it a little extra clean so that it, I don't have any more pigment when I go into the green palette. So I just use a two wash system, the dirty wash and the clean wash. So I go here first and then here second. If I'm just adding more water because I want to um, you know, get more on my brush and it's clean, I can just go to the clean, the clean jar. I use a, a cloth diaper for my, for my cloth, but you can use, you know, um, you can use anything, any kind of cloth, just you need something that you're going to basically dab off the water because you do have to control water. And we'll talk about water control in a, in a later date too, but um, it's important to have something that will work for that. So whether it's a little towel or, you know, shop towels, I know people use a lot. Um, now, tissue is handy to have for if you're dabbing something off, if you're lifting pigment, a spritzer bottle to activate your paints. Um, and then I also use, have a spritzer bottle of alcohol for some effects that I do, pencil, eraser, ruler. Um, a bone folder is helpful actually for, for tearing paper to different sizes. Um, um, but you can also use it as an embossing tool to create some texture. Masking tape, I always tape mine down uh, to a palette and I use an extra, extra plexiglass piece that I put my paper on 
And again, I'll demonstrate all this stuff at a later date. Masking fluid is a liquid. It's kind of like a gum that you lay down on the page. And then what it does is it, it protects the paper, the white of the paper, so you can paint over it. And then later you can lift that, that gummy, um, I don't know what else to call it, like gum, gum. It's kind of gummy. Um, you can lift that up and then that white of the paper that you painted that on will stay white and then you can do details in there. So that's a great way to mask or keep the paper white. You can also use tape. You can also use lots of things for masking, like masking tape, for example. Um, but this is great because you can do any kind of shape that you want with it. Uh, I also use a white gel marker, fine liner marker. Sometimes if I do line and wash or doing highlights, low lights, I um, you can use a palette knife. I also use an old credit card that I just cut up into like three sections. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll demonstrate all of these things over time. But just so you know, craft knife can be handy for scraping as well. But you can, again, use the credit card for some of that. A wax crayon uh, or a wax like a like a birthday candle for using that to to resist the paint as well. Toothbrush for splattering and salt is a is a good way to do some techniques that I'll be showing. Sponges can be helpful. A cork for stamping like um, I use that with a tissue to stamp out a moon to lift some paint and then Q-tips. And there are many other things that I pull in that are just some things around the house. But these are some of the basic things that I like to have handy uh, when I'm doing my painting. And I'll be demonstrating how to use most of these over the next, the rest of this month. So stay tuned for how to use them. And then where you can buy supplies. If you want the higher quality artist supplies, you're gonna find you're going to find more student grade if you go to more like the hobby shops. But if you want artist grade, there are plenty of places online. Amazon, of course, has a wide range of all of the materials these days. And locally in San Diego, if you're local, these are some of the Choices Blick, uh, Artists and Craftsmen Supply, and then um, this visual. But online, these are some of those supplies that I've used in, in historically, and they have uh, great options. So. All right, so that's that part of the program. I'm going to go ahead and, okay, so the papers that I have, I have a, I have a range that I'm going to be playing with. I'll be playing with these and demonstrating these next time because we're not going to have time this time. But there's everything from, this is a, they even make greeting cards out of watercolor paper. This is a um, I think it's 140 pound cold press. Yeah, that's a pretty standard. You're going to find that everywhere. And, and, but they do feel different. I mean, sometimes I'll feel the texture of 140 pound and it'll feel, it feels thinner than other 140 pound. And I don't know why that is, but, um, but anyway, you can actually find cards that are made. This is by Strathmore. So I'm going to be demonstrating that. This one um, let's see, I don't remember what that one is. I think I have, I think I have it. It's one of these. This is a very inexpensive uh, student grade by Canson. Now you might have one brand, but they make a variety of ranges of quality. This is only 90 pound. It's cold press. And I don't know if you'll be able to really tell from me holding it, but it's just like almost just a really thin cardstock. It's just not very thick. So if I were to put too much water on that, I'm going to get a lot of buckling and there's just not a lot of fibers to work with for the pigment to move. And with watercolors, you want the pigment to be able to move and play around. I mean, you get some really great effects by being able to do that. So I use this for practice pages and things like that. If I'm just practicing a technique and I'm not too worried about, you know, the quality, it's more the process. It's fine to get something that's really inexpensive and whatever weight, if just to practice technique, that's perfectly fine. Uh, this one is also by Canson, and this one is a 140 pound. You can see there. And this is what I've been using in the 
and then monthly classes. I just get the larger size and then I cut it down. So it's 12 by 18 and I just cut it down to the nine by six. And you can save some money by doing that rather than buying the nine, you know, I can get two pages. I think the larger it is, the better the deal. So if you can find a good deal, they also, this is a pad, like I was talking about, they come in different types. This is a pad where it's got glue on one side and I just tear it out just like a regular, you know, pad of paper. This one, it, which is is my favorite paper but there are many really good ones out there it's just what i what i've used that's a high quality paper and it's 100 percent cotton and that's the important thing to note about this it's, it's much more expensive to get 100 percent cotton but if it doesn't say 100 percent cotton or it doesn't talk about what the makeup of, of it is it's going to be a mix of probably just regular paper fibers. It's, it's not going to be 100% cotton. So it would say it if it if it is. This is a block. And what's great about the block is that it is glued on all four sides. Now it does have a little opening where you can slide a palette knife in so you can loosen it off of the block. But this just keeps it from lifting. So it's sort of like it's pre-taped down and you can just work with the whole block. The problem with this is if you wanted to work on more than one project at one time, you would of course have to, you can only work on one page at a time on the block. So, so that's the limitation of that, but it does make for, you know, it does make for a secure foundation to work on and it's nice to be able to move it around. Now I always glue my pages down, I mean glue, I always tape my pages down with some masking tape and I use, and I just, and actually, I think Kyle, you asked about this before. I just bought a big sheet of plexiglass and cut it down to different shapes. So I have different size palettes or a different size foundations, I guess I should say. But um, I do that because I like to be able to rotate my page. And if you tape it to the surface of the table, you can't rotate it. So maybe you're really coordinated more than I am. And that's quite possible. <laughs> But uh, I just find that I want to, if I, you know, sometimes there's a certain angle that works best for, for how I can hold it. And I want to be able to ro rotate my page around. The other flexibility it gives is you can turn it into like an easel. If you just take an old roll paper, you know, tape roll or something, you can put it on there and then you get an angle. And sometimes when you're doing a wash, you want that that angle that that um gravity to pull that paint down so this allows you to do that if you tape it directly to the table and the table doesn't move then you can't do that and that's what easels do they allow you to hold it at different angles but this allows you to do that i can use a a, a pretty tall tape roll or i can if i don't want too much i can use a shorter one so i can just prop it in any way that i want to get the movement that i'm looking for so that gives me some flexibility all right, the next thing is paints. I do use a variety of, of paints only because some of them I already had, some of them a friend gave me. So these are my two paints. Most of them are the M Graham. And like I said, that's, that's the favorite that I've used so far. But, um, but I, like, I like, do like the tubes. And I do have, as I mentioned before, I have a little travel kit that is the pans. And these are actually half pans. So this is half the size of a normal pan. They're really, really tiny. And it comes with this tiny, tiny little brush, which I don't, I don't love, you know, I don't love that brush. It doesn't give me a lot of options. Even on a, I mean, I wouldn't be able to do much of a wash. I mean, I just feel like that's so limited. This could do some details, but it's not. It's not going to be the only brush I would use unless I was just drawing like a person and not doing any backgrounds or anything like that. Maybe a tree would be fine. Um, and then these do come with, even though they're pans, they do come with little wrappers that have paint details. So like the pigment formulas. So that tells you the details. And I just keep those in case I have any questions about what the color is or I want to replace it. Now, what I could do is this came as a little kit, a little travel kit all together in this little box. Now, what I could do is when I run out of this paint, 
I could just refill these little wells that are already there with my tubes that I already have. Doesn't I don't have to necessarily buy the pans if I don't want to. Or if you want to keep it Winsor Newton and the same brand, you can just fill, you can buy the tubes of the colors that are here and just refill them when they start to get low. So those are options that you have. But this is nice travel because these stay, you know, these stay pretty well still. They don't run when I tilt it and in any, any direction. If I store it like that, it's not going to start flowing down like my engrams might do. And then I'll show you what the engrams look like in the palette. And this is my palette. Now I like this palette. This is a palette's an, another another piece of equipment that's important. And I like this one because it has plenty of wells to cover the the colors that I want to use, and even more. I mean, this is a pretty large supply of colors. And then it also seals up so I can, you know, travel with it. It this actually snaps closed. But like I said, mine kind of runs when I tilt it for too long. I've had that happen, especially with these colors. Maybe they just weren't dry enough, but I just think that it's just, it stays pretty gummy. So I just don't think it's really good to store sideways. But it also comes with this removable tray. And then, so there's two different working palettes you can use. And what I usually do with my paints, whenever I get a new, you know, palette of paints is I create a color chart. So I do a little sample of each of my colors. I write down what they are. Um, some of these, if they're not marked with like a code of like, this is a Winsor Newton, for example. So if they're not marked, they're the M Graham. And if they are marked, they're a different brand. So I just kind of, I just put that information there. So if I need more information about that particular color, I can find, I can find it by going to that database like, yeah. And I can store that right in there. And then my whole palette is, you know, easy to, easy to take in store. Um, and I don't know, I'll probably have a link for this. Oh, me hello is what that says there. But I'll probably have a link in my YouTube video video for these, these things. I'll find out where you can get it. Another thing that I do, and I'll talk about this when I talk about color, is I play around with my palette. I do a color wheel, so learning to mix, which we'll talk more about in the colors. Um, and then I also like to do the, the tint charts. And this is basically my palette. You just run the color this way, all the colors this way, and then you run the colors across and you see how they layer with each other. You can also create a chart where you mix them together on the palette and then you bring them to the page and then you learn what is what are the colors you can make. I mean some of these colors, you know, I don't have this color in my palette but I love that color and so if I have a project where I really want that color, I can go in and I can find out, you know, this one is Phthalo green mixed with cerulean blue. So I can go in and I can mix those two colors to get that color that I want. So these are good, some good guides to help you get to know what you have. Even if you only have the primary colors, this is all, these are all the colors that I made just mixing three primary colors. And that's not even all I can mix. I can keep, I can keep mixing them down and get more colors just from those three colors. So you don't have to have you know, 36 colors in your color palette. You can just do a basic, like I said, you could do the the warm and cool of each of those primary colors and then maybe the secondary colors and you can be good to go. Now I was talking about recipes and um, I want to do, I don't know if I have time and maybe I'll do this next time, but I have this ultramarine blue that's made by Schminka, and then I have this M. Graham ultramarine blue, and I'm looking at the label. I don't know if I can get the details of that label. They're just it's so, that's how my eyes look. That's how blurry that is. That's what my eyes do when I try to look at it. So I need like a magnifying glass. 
Uh, let's see, but it is made from PB29 is the, is the index color. And this one, PB29 also. So what I wanted to do, I thought that was the case. So what I wanted to do is just use these two colors side by side and see how similar they are. But I think I'll do that when we do the color, either next week or the color theory. And then this was my indigo. And again, this recipe is PB15-1 and PB66, which is completely different than the indigo, the Windsor Newton indigo. So those are some examples of just, you just have to be aware of those things so you don't get confused when you're trying to buy it. Because it's so wasteful if you go in and try to buy the matching indigo, say, okay, well, I really want to move over to my M gram and I'm in the middle of this project and I ran out of indigo. So I'm just going to go buy indigo and M gram. Well, then what happens is you go by indigo and mgram, it's not the same. So if, especially if you're in the middle of a project, you don't want that you don't want that to happen. So it's helpful to know. Oh, the other thing I do with colors is I, because I want to go with mgram in the future, is I just printed off their information sheet and I circled the ones that I have. So maybe I want to fill in colors or whatever. But now I know exactly what my palette consists of. And I think, for example, there's, um, there's some colors that I have that I already had. So like the indigo. And not every brand has every color. So in this case, there is not an indigo color that I'm seeing. But Payne's Gray is very similar to the indigo, so that could work. And if I look at the recipe of the indigo that was on that sheet, it actually was two of the pigments of blue that I already had and then a pigment of black that I don't have. So you can mix them to get that, to approximate that color. The problem with mixing, um, the challenge when you're first learning is consistency because really it's not like two spoonfuls of this and three, you know, it's not like a tablespoon here and a, it's a, it's a, like a dash of this or a, a you know, a, a paintbrush tip full of this. So it can be tricky to just get the right color. And that's why it's important to have those mixing palettes that allow you to see, you know, how the color is developing on this white background. And you can also do it on a practice sheet of paper to see what the color is to make sure you're you're getting it, but you want to mix a big enough amount of it so you don't run out of that pigment that you're trying to match. You know, if you're trying to finish a big area, then you want to make a big puddle of the same pigment so you get that consistency. So color mixing can be challenging, but again, we'll talk about that more later. All right, I think that's what I wanted to share about those. Now let's talk a little bit about brushes. And I even have more brushes than this, but uh, these are the ones that I try to keep handy. This is this is a mop brush. I think someone mentioned in the chat, this is also, you can use this for doing the washes. Now, when I say the washes, I mean like if I want my whole background of this to be blue, I want something that's going to put a lot of pigment on. I want to be able to wet the whole page, maybe touch in some color. I'm not going to want to use this tiny little brush because what's going to happen is I'm going to get all these little brush strokes and I don't want that. So um, trying to work on this, now if I'm making a house and I want to make some planks of, a, of the house, you know, like a wood house, this, this size would be great for that. But it's not going to be good for a wash brush. It's going to run out of water before I even get across the page. And you just don't want that to happen. So this size for, for this nine by six, this size would work fine for that. It's not too big where I'm putting too much water, but it's big enough where I'm gonna be able to make a whole, a stroke across and make it without running out of paint. So that's really the trick. It's, it's gonna depend on what you're using it for and the size of your paper. And that's gonna vary from project to project and person to person. Um, these are fairly long bristles as well. So those are gonna hold quite a bit of paint. Now this one is, I believe this is, a, this looks like a synthetic. So this is a synthetic. And again, because natural hair can absorb 
you know, it's more absorbent because it's porous, right? Hairs are porous. And so they just hold a lot more pigment. This is a mix of pigment, I mean, of pigment. This is a mix of um, synthetic and natural. And, and you can see the shape of it right now when it's dry, but watch what happens when I, when I wet it. I'm just gonna wet it and flick it, and then look at the tip on that. It's got just a really fine tip. This is almost like a combination between a round brush and a flat brush. So this has a lot of you, you know, unique behavior because I can use it like a flat, a flat brush if I go along the blade edge and then I can use it like a round brush if I just do scripting and I can kind of do washes. So this has a lot of flexibility. This is a, this one, they call it a um, stripe, striper. And um, this is the silver black velvet. And I, this is the only one I think I have of this particular brand, but I am very impressed with the, the quality of those bristles. Now I'm going to show that to you. This is a round brush. Look at what it looks like dry. And then if I just add water and I flick, it's going to come to a pretty nice point. This is a squirrel and you can see this dry to this really nice point. This has a really nice point on it. So I can get a really fine detail. Now this is the squirrel, as I mentioned. And if I, if I press down to use the body to run like a wide, you know, wide line, look at how those bristles stay bent. And this is what I mean by holding its shape. If I do that with, this is, this is actually um, a Kalinske sable. So if I take that and I run it and I run it along my, my hand and I bend it, it snaps back to shape. It doesn't stay folded like that. So that's what I'm talking about when I say that the bristles are snappy. You're going to get that with acrylics. They're going to snap back really nice. Um, let me do a round brush since I've been doing round brushes. I think this is, um, this looks like acrylic here. It, it has a you know pretty decent tip on it. And if I run that brush and I'm using the body, I'm really bending it, it snaps right back to straight. So the challenge that you're gonna find with the squirrel, while it's gonna hold a lot of pigment, it just might be a little bit trickier to have the control of the shapes because you have to take that into consideration. I think I have another squirrel here, this one, you know, it can be different from, from brush to brush um, too, depending on the length of the bristles and the quality of the squirrel itself. So this one, see, it comes to a really nice point. And then if I brush it, if I use the body and I bend it, see how it's got that, that bend to it. It's not quite as bad as this one. This one really bends, but it's, it can be tricky. And you can remedy that by just when you're done doing that stroke, you just can straighten it out a little bit, you know. But just be aware that if you're trying to really control, like do script, drawing with it, it might be hard to control the shape of it with, with the squirrel. Um, and this is a similar shape to that other, that stripper. It's, I think this was called a dagger dagger yeah so sometimes they'll they'll call um similar shapes you know different different manufacturers will use different names you might see this is called a rigor or a script this is really long and very small so there's not that many bristles and what this is good for is it can hold a lot of paint because it's long right? Look how long those bristles are, but you can get a really, really fine line and you can just run that line really far without running out of pigment. So you can, it's, you can really get a nice, like it's good for 
they call it a rigger because it's good for like rigging on a sailboat, for example. It'll give you a nice fine line and it'll go for a long time because it just has those long bristles. Because if you have these, these few bristles and it's shorter, it's just not gonna have the capacity that to get a long line. It's gonna, you're gonna run out of paint too quickly. Here's another one. It's again, for the size, it's just, it's got long bristles and it's really fine. It's gonna give you a finer line for even those finer, finer rigging. Look at how, look at how slender that is. But that's gonna go for quite a while before you run out. Now, what I recommend doing to see what your brushes can do is to create a guide. And I've done this. I've gone through all of my brushes and I just using the same, you know, I, I made a big mix of just any color, doesn't matter. And um, I wanted to be consistent with with um, make a big puddle because you want to use the same pigments. You can just see the variations that are just based on the brush. Brush, and I'm not sure if I if I did that here or not, but I get variation in this size and the color. But write down what the brush is, what the size is, whatever information, and then and then do a couple different things with it. Like this, I just took a flat brush and I ran it across, and then I rotated it as I went just to see what it was capable of doing it, I lifted it up as much as possible, just to see the range of shape that it can do. And do that with each of your brush types. Here's my rounds. I can see how long, I can see how long the paint will last, relatively speaking. M uh, many of these made it all the way to the end of the paper. So that's really good. If, if it didn't, I'd probably say, oh, that's not a, that's not a great, you know, rigor brush. Um, so I would recommend explore your what you have because the important thing is to understand what your equipment, what your materials will do. No, then you know the limitations of them, you know how they behave. Um, let's see, I think this one, oh, this one is color sable. Okay, so this one. Hey, Shauna. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, those those two squirrel brush, brushes that you showed us earlier, are those considered like inferior bristles or is there yeah. are they designed for a particular purpose of painting? Well, they're 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 inferior compared to uh, sable because I would say, and of course, this is sub, this is somewhat subjective. So some people might say they would never use squirrel. I'm simply trying to show you that the the, the differences. Squirrel yeah. will squirrel compared to a synthetic is going to hold a lot more pigment for the size of the brush that you have. You're going to oh. hold a lot. It's going to because it's going to absorb all of that into the the okay. coarseness. They also go to a really fine point. Okay. Those are great. Okay. Those are great features of squirrel, and I think they even hold more than the uh, sable does, if I'm remembering correctly. Okay. But you just need to be aware of its limitations and what might be challenging if you're trying to use it. If you're right. trying to really, you know, create some details and it keeps folding on you, and you're like, ah, you know. Just being aware of that, just know that you're going to probably not want to try to draw out and do script with it. You're going to want to hold it really lightly and use it differently than if you were trying to create details. With, yeah. with a synthetic brush or something that's not squirrel, you know, I'm going to be able to put a little bit more pressure, have a little bit more control and not have to, you know, reset my, my uh, brush. So sometimes I'll... Yeah. Just get frustrated. So I'm not saying there's different purposes for every brush. It really depends on what you're doing and what your style is. And maybe you're heavy handed. Maybe you like to press down, you know, just what you're doing. Okay. Um, and they all have their different purposes. And you could work with purely one or the other. And everybody, of course, has their subjective opinions about it. But I, if I'm talking about natural for me, my preference for purely natural 
as far as workability is I like the sable because it just has that springy, that springiness. So it goes back to its shape. And sometimes I do find myself a little frustrated when I've used the squirrel because my, you know, my tip just that folds up for me. So yeah, it, I think it would frustrate me too. It, lo it looks similar to the kind of brush that I've seen people use for like creating Japanese lettering. Uh -huh. I, I, I don't know if that's the one or not, but I was just curious if it had a specific purpose too. But yeah, I would be frustrated as well. I just wanted to ask that because I don't know if it had a specific purpose or not. Thank well, you. Yeah, it, it has its it has its places where it's it might be the best option. You know, if you're trying to lay down, if you're going a long stroke yeah. and you want to make yeah. sure you have enough pigment, it might be the perfect thing for that particular job. And that's okay. why it's just really important to play with them and see how they work for you and your style. I mean, some people are doing they all they do is is foliage or some people all they do is animals so it's it depends on your style and what you're doing and i and i wouldn't want to recommend or not recommend any particular thing i think it's nice to have a mix and sometimes i'll yeah. start with one thing and i go you know what that's just driving me crazy with how soft it is it's not working for this particular thing and then i'll switch up and grab a synthetic for that uh so hopefully that answers your question i mean i hate to not really give you i don't i don't really want to I don't want to put you in a box because I do think it's nice to have a mix personally. I do. No, that was perfect. Yeah, your answer was totally perfect. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yep, that was thank good. You. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, now a couple other brushes that I have here that I just want to highlight a little bit is this is a fan. I think it's called a fan. Yeah, rake fan. And this is um not necessary but i do think that this can help when i wet this and i mess with the bristles a little bit it gives me like kind of a, a textured see how the bristles separate i don't know if you guys are seeing that but the bristles separate out it's hard because they're white and it's white against white there see how the bristles separate so these this could be good for maybe doing grasses or hair, animal hairs, things like that. Um, doing maybe some different foliages, things like that. So all of these different brushes have their uses and they're fun to, fun to try out in different ways. You can get that effect also, um, and, and sometimes a, a, a cheaper, more inexpensive brush will give you uh, will work better for some some of these things but sometimes you can get a regular flat brush you can kind of get those bristles to separate out a little bit sometimes like i said it works better on cheaper brushes and you want them separate so that you can create a texture this is not doing it these ones just like to go right back where they were um let me get a cheap brush and see. it doesn't have to be a flat brush so this is um this is, oh no, this is a master stroke. This one, let's see what this one looks like. I put it in my other, I kind of put my least favorite brushes elsewhere. <laughs> okay, so you'll see this is a round brush, but look at what happens. All I did on those other ones is flick it. I put water on it and I flicked it, but see how this does not go to a tip? This would not be a round brush that I would, you know, choose over any of these other ones that I have here because it doesn't go to that tip. It doesn't give me that versatility. It'll work fine for bigger things. I have no idea what the makeup of this is. It might be, you know, one of those other, it looks like it's a natural fiber, but I don't, but it doesn't even say. So I could try to bring that to a tip, but it, look, it's just really not getting to a tip. It's just not, not it's kind of coarse hair. However, if I, because I don't care about it all that much, I can kind of abuse it a little bit and get this interesting shape that I could then use for some texture. So I can, you know, if it's good to have not so great brushes in your, <laughs> you know, too, because you can do different things with them and not, like I would never want to do this to my really great brushes. I wouldn't, because I just don't think that's great for the bristles. But this one is not one I'm too worried about. It's probably one of those like camel, you know, ones. But this would make great tree, like foliage or leaves and things like that. So um, 
if you don't get rid of brushes, there's always a use for them. Maybe you could use them for that sort of thing, or even bigger, you know, filling in maybe like a mop, a little bit more like a mop. It's just not going to give me that detail that I want. So it's just a little, you know, it's got different different things it can do, just not necessarily what I'm looking for when I'm trying to get um, when I want to have a round brush. Now this is. Um, this looks like maybe an ox, could be ox or something like that. It's real coarse, they're real coarse, which again can be fun to use if I'm trying to create some texture, I can, I can get some interesting texture with that. Now this also might work as a wash as well, um, just laying down, you know, broad strokes of color. It's just you know, but it's, you can see, it's going to give me, those bristles don't really like to come together. And so I might get more stroke lines than I want, depending on what I'm trying to get. Sometimes you want the stroke lines, sometimes you don't. And that's the important thing to know is, you know, what are you, what's the effect you're trying to get? And what is the tool to do the job? If you are just trying to go minimal, just get yourself a mid-range, you know, round, like this would work this is a 10, I, I would say maybe, a, now this of course is in Blick and they're 10. It's not gonna be the same in every, I wonder if I have, I might even have two that are the same size, but oh, no, they're about the same. Okay, these are both 10s, but you can see that the bristles look different, but the ferrules are the same size because these are from the same brand. But because this is a natural fiber and this is a synthetic, they just they just have different qualities. They look different. Uh, so ten in this particular brand is pretty decent. Um, this is the four, fourteen. It's a little bit larger, and the eight. You know, eight might be a good one. I could I could probably live with eight here as long as I had a nice. Wa you know, nice flat wash brush. Like I could probably get away with those two. Like I'm saying, I'm just trying to say minimal or maybe those two, this is, the problem is if I just have these two, I if I'm trying to do any detail, that could be tricky. Now this is, I think this one was the sable. Yeah, this is a sable. This is not a Kalinsky sable, which is a different sable, um, but it gets to a pretty nice tip. So I can still do some details with that. And I have the broad belly, I have the details, and then I have my flat. So this would give me a lot of versatility if I was really trying to just minimize the brushes that I had. I could get away with, you know, doing that. If I'm gonna get one brush, I might even consider this, because this could do, this could do my washes, um, this could do my details, this could do a rigor. Uh, this has a lot of options for me. So, um, so that's what I would probably say. Something like around, this is about, I think, three quarters of an inch. It's got longer bristles, so that holds a lot of pigment than, say, this is a, a, you know, kind of inexpensive synthetic. It's also like a three quarter feral. So those are the same size, but look at the length of those bristles. So you're going to get more pigment capacity with this brush than you are with this brush. Now this is a scrub, I think this one's called a scrub, yeah. This one's called a scrub and it's it's really hard bristles, they're really short, and this is just designed for lifting pigment back off, like a race, it's like an eraser, basically. So any short, um, firm bristled brush can do that. So if you had an old brush you didn't like and you just, you could, this is not that stiff, but you want them stiff enough because you're basically scrubbing. And this is where if you were using maybe the, the student quality paper, you might not be able to do too much of this without starting to lift the fibers of the paper. So you have to be careful if you're, you know, if you're doing scrubbing, I would say not to scrub on, if you're using like a durable cotton or something. All right, I think I've covered, the brushes. Um, typically, I when I clean them, what I do, there's my my 
cotton diaper. <laughs> if I'm if I'm doing something that's really wet, larger things, I'll put a sponge inside just to hold more water if I'm really, you know, but these are fairly small projects. I'm talking about if I'm doing like the, the big, the really big ones. But um, what I'll do is, let me get my water, is I rinse, I'll even go to those sink and I'll rinse there until I have no, uh, no more pigment. But I rinse it real good. I might do a little bit of, you know, brushing it on the bottom to kind of work it, but just be gentle. Don't, don't work them too much. Cause then just like our hair on our head, it can, it can get frayed, you know, the more we abuse it. So, and then I rotate as I'm pulling back, I rotate and that brings it to a nice tip. And then I can just stick it there and let it dry. And then it has the shape that I want when, it, when next time I use it. If, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't go to, you know, to the point I like, then I'll kind of help it along, but I, then I let it dry like that. And then after it's dried, then I'll put it in my, in my cup upright because I don't have one of those special fancy holders. <laughs> all right. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Healing Art After Hours. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you find this content helpful. And as always, happy creating!